Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, and then as you found your place in Luke 9, put your finger there and turn briefly to Luke chapter 17. We will go back to Luke 17, but I want to show you one particular verse in Luke 17, and then we will jump to Luke 9 and back to Luke 17 again. Do not let me confuse you right away. Luke chapter 17 is where the first verse is going to be from that we look at. As you are turning there, I would like to put in a plug for this coming Saturday at 5 p.m. is our Sweetheart's Banquet. There's a sign-up sheet in the back of the, uh, in the foyer back there. And so please make sure to fill uh, or sign up if you plan on coming. We do need to let the caterer know how many by tomorrow afternoon. And so for those of you who may have some friends that you would like to invite as in previous years, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but we just need to know as best a number as we possibly can, especially because of the catering situation uh, that they're going to make for that many, maybe a few more, but we're going to pay for however many we say. And so tomorrow afternoon we'll put that number in. Always a wonderful time together. And then I also need to put in a plug for this, that during it we had said nursery provided. That's true, but Miss Laurie Kenyon has volunteered herself to make a Valentine's Day sweethearts, or not a sweetheart, but a Valentine's Day party for the young people. And so that'll be going on here in the back as well. And so more than just nursery provided as much as a little party for them up here in the junior church room. All right, the Gospel of Luke chapter 17. It begins, our reading begins in verse number 28, Luke 17, 28. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. And then look at verse number 32. Remember Lot's wife. Now as far as we know, this is a lady in the Bible that is unnamed. We don't know her name. We just know her as Lot's wife. Even the Lord Jesus Christ would simply say, remember Lot's wife. And we want to see today why it is that we need to remember Lot's wife. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help us this morning. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we begin today, we are in desperate need of having your help in the Scriptures. We want to know you and the power of your resurrection, but very simply we come and we ask that you would be glorified in the reception of the Word. We know that your word has already been given the blessing. We know that every word of God is pure. And with this understanding, we come before you and simply say, convict us, teach us, and comfort us by the Spirit of God, and may your name be glorified through it. I pray that we would be updated, for lack of better words. I pray that we would move to a more pure walk with you as we remember Lot's wife this morning. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people prayed and said... Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Now turn with me to Luke chapter 9, and we're going to establish a few points in the New Testament before we move back to the book of Genesis. The book of Luke chapter 9, and we're going to begin looking towards the latter part of the chapter. Let's pick it up at verse number 51. Now as we look at verse 51, let's talk about the judgment of a disciple. It says in verse 51, And it came to pass, when the time was come that he, Jesus, should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers before his face, and they went, and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Now a student of the Bible understands that in these times, the Jews and the Samaritans were not very friendly to each other. And that's why the story of the Good Samaritan stands out in our mind. And so the disciples are sent forward. They go to the Samaritans. They're trying to make a place ready for Jerusalem. It says in verse 53 that they, the Samaritans, did not receive him because he set his, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. There's the fight. 
The Samaritans did not like those who were Jews or those who loved the Jews. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? So this is where we talk about the judgment of a disciple. We need to be very careful here to have the mindset of James and John. Now I know that John was the beloved disciple. I know that John was the one who would lay his head on the bosom of Jesus. I know that it was John that loved him the most. But I'm telling you that this John, with his love for Jesus, had a little bit of what we may call a flare of righteous indignation for the cause of Christ nonetheless. And he said, Jesus, I wish that we could call fire down from heaven like Elijah did. Let's just wipe out all the Samaritans. That's what he's talking about. Jesus, can we do this? Look at Jesus' response. He turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. Church, we need to be very careful. Even as disciples of Jesus Christ, with zeal that rises up with inside of us, we see the wicked, we see the error of their way, and we say, God, why don't you just wipe them all out? God, why can't we call fire down from heaven and destroy them? They don't like you, they don't like your people, and we always warn about people that don't like you. Jesus turned and looked at them as he would turn and look at us today, and he would say, be careful, turn ye back, I rebuke you, ye know not of what manner of spirit ye are. We have to be careful as believers to have the right spirit with dealing with other people who do not know God and do not love God the way that we do. Look at what it says in verse 56. For the Son of Man, Jesus speaking, is not come to destroy men's lives. But why is He come? You know why He's come. He has come to save them. And they went into another village. And so what we see is the judgment of a disciple. We need to be very careful to understand what spirit we are. Now we know that the more we fall in love with God, the more the hatred we have for sin, the more the hatred we have for our own sin first and foremost. And that is the way it's supposed to be. But you better be very careful to take matters into your own hands when you think that they should all be wiped out. We should have the philosophy of Jesus Christ. I didn't come to destroy. In my act of the cross, the burial, the resurrection, I came to give life and it is in me to give peace unto all men through my own blood. And then they went into another village and learned another lesson. So we see the judgment of a disciple. Then in verse number 57, and it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. We see the job of a disciple. The job of a disciple is to follow God. Now as we look at the job of a disciple, we see that this disciple comes to him and says, I will follow thee. It is of a certainty. I will be there by your side. I will walk with you. I will be behind you. There will be times I'll be out in front of you. I will be paving the way as a believer, setting my example for others. I will follow thee wherever you go, Lord. Then look at how Jesus responded. And Jesus said unto him in verse 58, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. If you're not careful, you could get swept up in some type of teaching that is not biblical. There was once called on TBN, very televised uh, broadcast by the Word Faith Movement. And they would prophesy to you and they would tell you that as Jesus Christ walked on this earth, Jesus Christ had the best of everything. Jesus Christ had all the money. Jesus Christ had a big house. Jesus Christ had all that things could afford. And we see that that is not scriptural. We see that rather when the Lord was in this world, when He walked on this earth, He said foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay His head. Jesus did not have everything when He walked on this earth. Jesus did not have the biggest and the bestest part in my grammar. Jesus was simply living His life in the perfect will of His heavenly Father as He was sent to minister unto people. We see in verse number 59, and He said unto another, follow me. But He said, Lord, suffer me first to go 
and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at my home and at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. A job for the disciple is to follow Jesus. The job for the disciple is that when he puts his hands to the plow, he's not looking back. He's not getting distracted. He is focused on the job that is at hand. Now, I like mowing grass. And when I was out there at Princeville Baptist Church as an evangelist out of that church, there was about two acres to mow. And I'd start on one corner. I always try to mow in different directions. But I'd start on one corner, and I'd set my sight on another point all the way on the other side. And I decided I'm going to try to mow the straightest line that I possibly can. You ever been there before, ever tried to do that? But if you're looking back... It is very hard to do that, isn't it? It can be very hard when your eye is on the prize. But I'm telling you, the more you look forward, the more you keep your eyes right, the more you stay on the right path, the straighter the line will be, the straighter the plowing will be. In fact, the plowing job will get done because you're focused, you're fervent, you're not slothful in business, but you're fervent in spirit and you are serving the Lord. And no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit or prepared or ready for the kingdom of God. What's all this have to do with remembering Lot's wife? I want to show you. Go back to Luke chapter 17 as we begin looking at this situation. Luke 17, as we talk about in verse 32, remembering Lot's wife, why did Jesus put this illustration here? Begin reading or following along at verse number 20 of Luke 17. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. What he means is you cannot necessarily look and see. Though you do see signs of the times, you're not going to be able to behold it coming. Why? Verse number 21. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. And ye shall not see it. And they shall say unto you, See here, it's coming. See there, that means the Lord's coming. Go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of one part under heaven shineth unto other part under heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in His day. But first must He suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. So just as quickly as the lightning would come from here and go over there in your sight in the sky, so is the coming of the Son of Man man and you understand in the scriptures that you have to be very very careful not to get involved in those who who say it's going to happen now or this is when it shall happen for no one knows except God himself and we come to the scriptures and we are reminded of that again and then he begins to give some more information he says but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation he came unto his own his own received him not he went to the cross that's what it was referring to he rose again he has ascended into heaven the son of God has went through his crucifixion but then he says in verse 26 not only must the resurrection happen but then in verse 26 and as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be in the days of the son of man Now we typically say, oh those are wicked days and no doubt we are waxing worse and worse and that is a sign of the time. But look at what Jesus says. He's not pointing out the wickedness. He says in verse 27, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. They were not only evil in the imaginations of their heart continually, they were also careless with spiritual things. They had pursuits in their life that were not spiritual. They went after things that were temporal instead of things that were eternal. Then it says in verse number 28 where we picked up when we began. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat. They drank. They bought. They sold. They planted. They builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Now, go to Ezekiel chapter 16. 
We see in Luke 17 that there is some things mentioned that refer to how careless they were. They had vain pursuits. There was nothing spiritual about them. They wanted to have life temporal but not life spiritual. We look at the book of Ezekiel chapter 16 and we realize some of the wicked areas why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. In Ezekiel 16 we pick up in verse 47. Ezekiel 16, you say preacher... I already know why God destroyed Sodom. It was because of their homosexuality. Yes, but no, that wasn't it. Look at Ezekiel 16, verse 47. Yet hast thou not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations. But as if that were a very little thing, thou wast corrupted more than they in all thy ways. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Now let me give a little bit of background. God is talking to His people. And God is telling His people they are worse than their sister Sodom. Now look at how He describes how bad they are. Look at verse 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Look at it. Pride. Uh Uh-oh, fullness of bread. Mm. The abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them, Sodom, away as I saw good. My friends, yes, homosexuality was in Sodom. But yes, pride was there. Yes, they had fullness of bread. Yes, they were haughty. Yes, there was idleness in their hands. They didn't strengthen the hands of the poor and needy. Sodom was taken out for things. Things that you and I do every single day. And then we see that Jesus doesn't even mention these things. Jesus says they ate, they drank. You could maybe consider that impartiality to fullness of bread. But then we see Jesus mentioning they married wives. They had things that were good. They builded their houses. What we simply need to understand that when looking at Ezekiel and looking at Luke and looking at Genesis is that when God killed or took away Sodom, God was simply saying they did not care about spiritual things. They care more about the temporal and their sin than about the God that created them. Now go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Now we're moving around. I hope we're having a finger flipping good time this morning. 2 Peter chapter number 2. I want you to see Lot here in chapter 2 of 2 Peter as we begin in verse number 6. Now please, please understand that we are building up to some points today. But any of this could be driven home in all of our lives. Look at what it says. Let's begin at verse number 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto all those that should live ungodly. And we stand here and say, yeah, yeah, God, go get them. Yeah, God, you just took out the ungodly. Yeah, yeah, you rained hell, fire, and brimstone down. But remember what Jesus said. Be careful to know of what manner of spirit... Ye are. Look at what it continues. Here's the point that we're getting at. But God delivered and God delivered just. That word isn't talking about him by himself. That word just is referring to righteous. And God delivered righteous or just lot. Vexed. That word vexed means tormented. With the filthy conversation of the wicked. When Lot was in that city. He was literally tormented by being in that city. Can I say this? You better be careful what influences you put yourself around you better be careful what places you go what you hear what you see because daily you can vex or torment the inner man where the spirit of God lives by what you see and what you hear that's in the world notice what it says in verse number eight parentheses for that righteous man lot 
dwelling among them, Sodom and Gomorrah, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. But isn't it awesome how to read verse number 9? That the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. And day after day, Lot was in that wicked city, not just wicked because of their pride and their arrogancy and their fullness of bread or their homosexuality but simply because they did not care about spiritual things and therefore Lot didn't care about spiritual things. Hmm. Genesis chapter 19. We got to be careful where we go. We got to be careful what we see. We got to be careful what we hear. We better make sure that there are influences in our lives that's good to the hearing for the things of God, that's good to the seeing for the things of God. Because day after day, we could vex our own righteous soul by what we see and what we hear. Preacher, I'm not bad. I'm not living in abomination. But wait a second. You could believe in living in the same exact things that God destroyed Sodom for, for the desire of temporal things more than the desire of God you're setting your affection not on things above but you're setting your affection on things beneath and God says whoa whoa Christian stop look at chapter 19 of the book of Genesis we begin at verse number 14 or excuse me verse number 20 and the men said unto Lot hast thou here any besides Son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whosoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place, Sodom and Gomorrah. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. Their wickedness is great. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters and said, Up! Get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto the sons-in-law. So here it is. Lot, the righteous man. Lot, the just man, is within the city of Sodom. He is supposed to be a man of God. He is supposed to be someone with influence. But as a man of God, he put himself in a place that he should not have put himself in. He put his family in a place that he should not have put them in. And before too long, he could not have a say with his own daughters, with his sons-in-laws. He did not have any pull with spiritual things. Could it be that because he didn't care about spiritual things... And his daughters didn't see him care about spiritual things. That they came to a point where they decided dad's mocking. He's not making any sense. He's not going about this the right way. But daddy's saying, please, don't you understand? Daughters, don't you understand, son-in-laws? God is real and God is going to do what he says. And he begs and he pleads. But they just laughed and they mocked and they stayed put right where they were at. And the reason that we have to believe is because day after day, Lot himself had no influence spiritually. He did not care. But all of a sudden, I care. All of a sudden, it's real. Why should I believe you? What have you done? What have you done, Dad, to prove that in your life? What have you done? They would say to Lot, What have you done? What have you showed to me? What life have you lived that would mean that? And therefore, he lost his sons and laws, never having won them. Do you remember what Abraham did in chapter number 18? If you look back there at verse number 50, or verse number 27, there's 50 people. Abraham prays, God, will you answer my prayer? Will you not destroy Sodom for 50? Then if you would continue reading, would you not destroy Sodom for 45? Would you not destroy Sodom for 40, for 30, for 20, for 10? God, please. And what God told Abraham is, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. Think about this, those of you who know the story. When Lot and his wife escaped the city, how many were there? Lot, his wife, and their two daughters. How many is that? I know it's Sunday teenagers, and I know you don't like math, but that's four. 
God had Abraham praying and as Abraham was praying he said God don't destroy it for ten but what we see is that when a lot and his family leaves there is four what I want to show you is simply amazing we look at verse number 22 of Genesis 29 lot and his daughters and his wife are still in the city and they say to him haste thee escape thither for I cannot do anything till thou become thither even though there wasn't ten when Lot was within that city he could not be destroyed by the judgment of God righteous Lot could not be impacted by the fire from heaven righteous Lot had to be removed from the occasion before God's judgment could fall Now God wasn't going to destroy the cities if there were ten, but God wouldn't destroy the cities if there were one just lot that was still there. Child of God, isn't it good to know that when you're made righteous in the eyes of God, hell fire and its damnation, the judgment of Almighty God cannot touch you? Isn't it good to know and understand that that the eternal hell is not your location? The judgment of God for eternity, you will escape, you will be brought out, you will not have to face what eternal damnation brings to the sinner without God, but that ought to give you more of a burden to reach those who are within the city, not to be in Impacted by the seeing and hearing, but to impact them. He was rather impacted instead of impacting someone else. I ask you a question How's your impact? We look at verse 23, the sun was risen upon the earth and Lot went into Zor. And the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. And then he overthrew the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. When we look at Lot... We understand that the judgment of God did not fall until Lot was removed with those who would go with him. And then when the judgment of God fell, the only thing that they were told to do was when they escaped, they were not to look back lest they would be consumed. Lot tried to do what he could. Oh no, please, don't destroy the city. He would say in verse number 18, Oh no, don't do this. But God's mind was already made. Up And in the just judgment of God, God historically took away some cities that did not honor him and did not please him. And Lot escaped all of that. And in the process of time, he lost his friends, he lost his house, he lost the city that he ruled in, he lost his position within that city. He even came out of that city to only lose his wife and then have his daughters commit fornication with him, with their own daddy, and sin was continually within the family. Lot made a choice at one time to look in the wrong direction, to pitch the tent in the wrong way. And what we see is a choice to go against God, is a choice to step completely away from him to end up without influence to end up without a spiritual care in the world to end up with no influence when rather Jesus called us to be disciples that makes disciples he called us to reach out and to win others but very rarely will you find a child of God who is doing so and it's even more rare to find one who is on fire for the things of God who is unhindered by what he sees and what he hears who does not put himself in a place to be tampered with by the ways of the world here is just Lot but I submit to you that there's so many in America today that live in this place naming themselves as Christians they are just like Lot they vex their soul from day to day with what they see and what they hear and they expect God to hear them when they cry and they expect God to bless them with their life but rather they are tormented with the wickedness all around them and as we remember Lot's wife this morning we remember the fact that there was a man that she followed that did not care about the things of God. When we look at the wife in verse number 26, she was the one that looked back from behind him. She's following her husband. 
And you can't help but think that Lot is saying, don't look back, guys. Honey, don't look back. The angel said, if we look back, they gave us a message that we will be destroyed as well. Don't look back. Honey, don't look back. Daughters, don't look back. Just keep moving in the right direction. Flee this town. And no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Lot's wife's influence ended right there that day when she looked back. Everything that she was created for stopped at the judgment of God in her life because she did not obey the word of God. When we remember Lot's wife, we remember a lady that looked back and was simply disobedient to the command of God. One simple look, friends, can destroy your life. And one simple look from Lot's wife destroyed her. And she became a pillar of salt. There's two different pictures of salt in the Bible. There's salt that's savory. There's salt that's good for something. And then there's salt that's unsavory and good for nothing. But to be cast out, to be trodden under the foot of men. And here is a picture of someone who was termed in the salt that was good for nothing. She would be a memorial. She would be a picture of someone that wasn't obedient. Someone that made it out of judgment but stopped their life for God. Because of one little strand of looking back and disobedience. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Gentlemen, can I remind you of your place in the family? Can I remind you of the authority that is yours? Not to rule in a way that is not right, but to rule in a way that honors God. To rule in a way that leads your family in the way of righteousness. That would encourage others. But let me just say this. Because you're encouraging in the right way does not mean that everyone in your family will choose to do right. Though she was rescued out of that city, she had to decide to keep walking the angels and the messengers didn't take them all the way out they took them partially out and they said go to Zor and when you get there don't look back when you get there God's judgment's going to come they chose to run they chose to get to a place of safety and they chose whether or not they would be obedient to God or not can I encourage a child of God by way of New Testament application don't look back Don't look back. There's nothing in this world for you. Don't look back. And all things spiritual, do not be impacted by the booze that you used to be in. Do not let the drugs that used to hold you down or get you uh, no cares in the world. Don't let them cause you to be careless with the things of God. Don't look back. Don't let the addictions that you have with your eyes hinder you from going on for God. Don't look back. Don't go back to the world. There's nothing in this world for you. Put your hands on the plow and move forward for the glory of God. God didn't just destroy Sodom for their homosexuality. He destroyed it for their pride, their arrogancy, their fullness of bread, the idleness of their hands. They did not strengthen the hands of the poor and needy. They were lifted up in pleasing themselves, building their houses, marrying the right person being full of food and making sure they had drink when in all reality they never checked their spiritual thermometer they never saw where they were at with God, they never gave it a second thought if they were right or wrong with God can I ask you, have you considered where you're at with God blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled Do you hunger for Him? Do you thirst after Him? Friends, do not put yourself in the judging hand of God because of your lack of submission as a disciple. You know as well as I do that the book of Hebrews talks very much about someone who is not right with their God. And as someone who is not right with their God, though they are saved, God can choose to remove by way of discipline if they're not responding, if they're not turning back. God could take a child off of this earth and remove him from their position on this earth because of their example or lack of example for the kingdom. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is where we'll end as the Lord leads, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now a little bit earlier I said that 
the judgment of the disciple, we have to be very careful. Now, I know there's some folks in here that are more inclined to be loving and gracious. And you're thinking, I wouldn't dare ask God to allow me to send fire down from heaven on someone. But then you got the other side of the church, or mixed within, that says, oh, I am so that person. Take them out, God. They don't deserve to be here. We got all different types here. Just like someone sitting at a table and someone knocks a glass of water over. You got the servant that gets up and says, oh, let me get that for you. And you've got the one who is full of forgiveness that says, it's okay, I know you didn't mean to do that. And you got the prophet over there saying, what in the world were you thinking? Why did you knock that thing? We got all kinds of disciples within this room for the Lord. But I do want to say this when you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 11. He that is spiritual or excuse me, verse 15, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. I'm not telling you not to judge. I'm just telling you how to watch, how you judge and what you judge. Look at verse 15, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things. People like to take the verse out of context. Judge not that ye be not judged. That is right within its context. But here, my friends, I want to show you that if you are a spiritual person, you're going to judge all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. You're going to realize this. If I'm right with God where I need to be, I'm going to look towards Sodom and Gomorrah in the first place and say, I don't need their influence. I do not need to become careless. I do not be, need to become in a place where I could possibly become like they are. We need to be careful to remember that we are all so easily inclined to fall into our old nature. We need to be impacted and influenced with the things of the Spirit of God. We need to know how to be among them, but not of them. We need to know how to reach them without becoming them. And we look at the Scriptures and we understand that if you're spiritual, you're going to judge all things. You're going to say the bridge is out in this direction I'm not going to go that way because of what it will do to my life and my families remember Lot's wife with one look with one choice with one thought she decided to turn around and look and see I like watching storms roll in I like it when I get to see the clouds move in some real cool formations I'd be kind of like my sister and like to go chase him if I could and see what's going on. Maybe Lot's wife had that desire. I've never seen the sky move like this before. But wait, God said, no, don't look. But as she turned and she looked, she was looking back to everything she had, everything she was leaving, uh, her family that was still there. I'm telling you, church, even if it goes against the ones you love and the things you possess, God is greater than those things. God is greater than those loved ones. And you've got to move on in the Word of God, in the ministry of the Scriptures, and you've got to look ahead in judgment and say the bridge is out if I go that way but if I go this way with God the bridge is not out church remember Lot's wife I don't know in what way that this applies to what you're going through but we've been given an encouragement today to be a spiritual people to care more about the eternal than the temporal to be a people that will not look back, but we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And we look to him and we say, Lord, keep me right where I need to be. Please don't get it, be a Peter and take your eyes off of the Lord, but keep your eyes on him this morning. Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, we come to a passage in the Bible that's used by Jesus as an example of how not to live as a disciple. Not to live in judgment, not to live avoiding our responsibility, not looking back, but continuing to look forward. And so we come before you today and we say, Lord, help us to have the right view. Help us to have the right vision. Help us not to be of the world, though we're in the world. Help us to live in the power of Jesus' name, to pursue holiness in Christ, to live in your comfort, even in the midst of a crooked and perverse 
generation and nation of whom we shine as lights in this world. Help us not to be snuffed out, Lord, but help us to be brightly shining though the days are growing dimmer and dimmer all around us. Help us to remember Lot's life, wife, and help us to make a move toward the things of the Spirit today. We pray this in Jesus' name. And as the pianist begins to play, let's stand to our feet. If you need to come to this altar this morning and pray and seek His face and ask God to give you the right things to see and the right things to hear, then please, my dear friend, do that. If you need to come before your God and say, Lord, help me not to look back. Help me to keep looking in the right direction. Help me to be someone who's fit for the kingdom of God. Help me to be a good workman in the word. Help me not to be a memorial that the saints look at as someone that gave up or tucked tail or turned around. Help me to be someone who's fervent and faithful in the ministry that I have been blessed with and given by God. We all have an influence. I wonder what that influence will be. Lot's influence was not for the things of God. He tried to win them, but it was too late. The way he lived his life prior was the greatest testimony, and it was a testimony of unfaithfulness. And therefore, even his wife would turn, and even his wife would look back. Dear gentlemen, dear ladies, please, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Maybe you're here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Our God is a God who's full of mercy and full of love. I know that we've rested upon the judging hand of God. And shall not the judge of all the earth do right? As Abraham said in Genesis 18 before Sodom was overthrown. God is perfectly just and God is perfectly right in judging our lives. But let us make sure of this, that when He looks at our life, He doesn't see ourselves. He doesn't see our works. But He sees us standing in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He sees the blood of the Lamb. And when He sees the blood, He shall pass. He shall pass over you with His judgment. If you're not saved in here today, if you haven't been rescued by the Lamb, come to Him. Run to Him before it's too late. And child of God, get busy. Put your hands on that plow. Don't look back. Work, labor for the cause of Christ. Fulfill the obligations that God has given to you. Don't just sit on the sidelines and cheer someone else on. Cheer someone else on that's plowing right next to you. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we bow before you today, we thank you for the privilege of being in your house this morning and hearing from your word. I pray that something that has been given today will help us to move a little bit closer to where we need to be, that we would take your word seriously and that we would not allow the things of this world to impact us or influence us with a lack of concern for the things of God. But help us to do the contrary. Help us to live so filled with the Spirit of God that we are impacting others with the Word of God. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this privilege to be in your house today. Ultimately, may you be glorified as we decide, commit, and glorify this year. We ask it in Jesus' name.